was just asking Daniel what, what he does for a living. <laughs> you know, these questions get difficult to answer. Um, so uh, we can't really see you, but I think you can see us. Just so you know, we can't see you. So if you start sticking your tongues out at us or anything, we will have no idea. We are staring into artificial suns. They're very <laughs> bright. Um, Daniel, this is wonderful that we are doing this together. And I'm, um, I'm excited because I have no idea where this conversation is going to go tonight. And we're touching into um, topics and stories that I think neither one of us uh, certainly are, are in the habit of bringing into our public discourse. So both of us do a lot of public speaking. Um, both of us are working with the concept of how do we potentially make the changes we need to make to keep our species and several others around. Um, but this time we're taking this conversation somewhere slightly different. Um, and, and I'm excited about that because the question that is kind of underneath all of this for me is the question that we sometimes ask in the warm data work, which is what is continuing? What's continuing? And in any kind of evolutionary process, there is a need for there to be continuance. You cannot have continuance without discontinuance. Organisms have to change in order to stay in the, in, in the ecologies as they change. Contexts change. If you don't change, you become obsolete. If you change too much, you become obsolete. So how do we not become obsolete? Now, this is, um, interestingly, I, I think, an intergenerational question. Uh, and very frequently, when we look out at the, the way in which um, change projects are structured, they seem to be structured toward solutioning for the problems. But this territory of what happens between parents and children, between adults and elders, between grandparents and ancestors, this question is hardly ever in the room. Where did we learn to have a relationship with nature? with each other, with the idea of identity or idea of success. Who did you learn to be at the breakfast table? How is the person that you are now somehow a, a ruminating, a rippling of those generations that came before you in ways that you, some of which you may be aware of, but many of which you're not? Who are you? Who am I? And what are the ways in which the person that I think I am and the person that you think you are are actually holding each other into those systems that we spend our days thinking we'd like to change? Are we keeping each other in the perpetuating existing systems? with our ideas of identity and prestige, of what it is to be a parent, what it is to be taking care of an elder, what it is to be in this society. So, so this intergenerational question for me is really r resonant with where's the change. Now, one interesting thing here is that um, both Daniel and I, and I don't know the stories, and he doesn't know my stories, so you know, we, we, we're riding skateboards up here. Um, we both grew up in really uh, unorthodox ways. And I think it's no surprise that we are both 
thinking about the changes in the world in unorthodox ways. So what can we bring? What can we share? What can we explore together in this territory that might be um, generative and useful and at very least amusing um, for each other and for you? <laughs> So, so Daniel, I want to um, put you on the spot a little bit because um, I don't think that we can have anything in this conversation if we don't have as an assumption the meta crisis. So, I think we could say that for a whole lot of situations that the assumption at this point needs to be the meta crisis. But if you were going to give us a quick version of this thing called the meta crisis. So it's in the room so that everything else we're talking about is predicated on this, okay? Um, how would you do that? It's so great to see you. Well, um, it's fun that we're doing this and that we don't know where we're gonna go in the conversation and everybody who I got to meet briefly coming in seemed like great people so this seems, I don't know, it seems like a cool community. Um, I know the video quality wants it. Is there any way this can turn down the tiniest bit? Because I'm mostly in full blindness. Um, <clears throat> is oh, so much better. Thank you. Um, is anyone not familiar with the meta crisis? Just hands, so I have a sense. I'll try to do this very briefly then. It's actually a fucked up thing to ask. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I don't mean for me. I mean to, like, there's an emotional existential weight of the topic mm. for everybody else to just enter and then not actually process. But whatever, you ask for it. Um, so a big part of my work is looking at catastrophic risks facing the world, catastrophic and existential risks. A lot of people focus on this topic the lens through which I have focused on it is um, looking not just at catastrophic risks in the areas, in, in the ways that we normally silo it. So obviously militaries look at escalation pathways to large scale war. Environmentalists look at environmental risks, which there's some unifying frameworks to not just look at um, species extinction or climate change or soil erosion, but things like planetary boundaries that look at many different uh, catastrophic risks. There are groups like uh, the big group at Oxford and Cambridge and others that look at exponential tech risks, risks, risks that could have never happened when we didn't have as powerful a technologies emerging, like the risks associated with synthetic biology and AI and nanotech and cyber and drones. So <clears throat> each of these risks also acts, also acts like a force multiplier for the other ones. So if we look at the nature of the social media algorithms, optimizing for engagement, and the optimization for engagement often looks like things that scare us or upset us or drive tribal identities. It's pretty easy to see that the social media algorithms drive polarization. The polarized population in a democratic society ends up electing a polarized representative class, causes uh, gridlock in open societies, closed societies, Authoritarian societies don't have that issue, so you end up getting a net movement as a result of that towards autocracies being more effective. Um, but you can see that the social media issue is like a crisis in itself, but it's also a force multiplier for all the other issues because we can't solve climate change if half the population disagrees with anything the other half the population wants to do, or COVID or anything. Um, you can look at climate change as a risk in and of itself, but also as a force multiplier because as soon as you look at not just total denisification of the planet, but things like extreme weather events causing uh, human migration um, and refugee issues. I think Sweden is very acutely aware of refugee issues currently and the fact that after Syria, uh, nobody wants climate change mediated refugees coming into their country and yet you're about to, you know, UN predicts 300 million and some groups predict up up to a billion climate change refugees in the next handful of years, somewhere between five and 10 years. So what does the world do with that? 
Well, that acts as a force multiplier for resource wars, which can then become large-scale wars, which can become collapse to supply chains, on and on. <clears throat> so the meta crisis is looking at not just the individual risks, but the cascades between them and uh, the underlying drivers that they all have in common, whether we're talking about climate change or war or um, forever chemicals in the environment, we can see that perverse economic incentive is a driver of all of them. We can see that externalities, where we're optimizing for one thing but causing harm somewhere else, is a driver in all of them. We can see that multipolar traps, where one group feels like it has to do the fucked up thing because another group is doing it, and if the other group does it, there's so much competitive advantage, so nobody wants to give up the nukes first because maybe the other guy didn't really give up the nukes, right? And nobody wants to price carbon properly because if Western countries price carbon properly and China doesn't, all it is is a seeding of the world to autocracy running the 21st century. And nobody wants to agree to not build AI weapons because how do we know that the other guy's not building AI weapons in an underground military base? So we're just an all out race for everybody to build them, which increases the likelihood that everybody dies from them. So if we can't solve multipolar traps or coordination issues, we can't solve any of the things. So the meta crisis is basically saying that there's not one or a few catastrophes facing civilization. There is a whole series of them, many, many different escalation pathways that are the result of very deep civilizational structures. And that unless we change things like the global economic system writ large, you can't have a, our global economic system requires exponential growth just to even keep up with interest. Exponential growth of a monetary system means exponential demand on energy and exponential demand on materials. Can't do that on a finite planet forever. That means a level of change of global economy that we have no idea really how to do. And the exponential growth was the answer after World War II to not having World War III because the major nation states could all have more without taking each other's stuff because they took it from nature faster. If you don't take it from nature, now you go back to zero sum dynamics and higher orientation for war. So, and World War II was the first time we had catastrophe weapons. So it was the first time after which you couldn't have the major superpowers war. But we had one catastrophe weapon that was really hard to build. So you could limit it to only two countries and now, you know, maybe eight or so countries that had it. But with AI weapons and with drone weapons and with cyber weapons and with bioweapons getting increasingly cheap because exponential tech decentralizes power, but that we hear a lot of the good story of democratizing power for everyone, but democratizing catastrophe weapons for everyone is a problem, right? The ability to synthesize genomes for $1,000, which is three years away. In basements, when science open publishes all of the results of gain-of-function research, how does the world make it through decentralized catastrophe weapons for everyone where even accidents are enough to cause those issues? So basically, humanity's at a place where it has to make changes that are unprecedented, like not changes as big as the post-World War II change, and not changes as big as like the beginning of democracy and nation states in the you know 16th, 17th century, but more like a change as fundamental as the invention of stone tools with early hominids, like it's a, because uh, it's a change of evolutionary process itself. Uh, where as long as we're seeking to optimize in-groups at the expense of out-groups using exponential tech, you get exponential conflict, which self-terminates in a finite space. And as long as we're optimizing some metrics at the expense of others, you get exponential externalities in a finite space. Exponential externalities self-terminate, exponential conflict self-terminates, which means with exponential tech, we have to solve problems in ways that don't cause other problems, which means we have to really think through all of the externalities much, much, much better. And we also have to benefit some groups, not at the expense of other groups. And that means we have to both have radically better uh, conflict theory, in which identity is not bound to in-groups at the expense of out-groups, and we have to have radically better complexity processing. And <clears throat> But this really does mean different identity and different relationship to what getting ahead and progress and all those things mean. So this is the stuff I focus on, and how do we make it through all the catastrophes where the control mechanisms we put in place to avoid them don't become dystopic. So we want a future that is neither catastrophes nor dystopias, but some third option in which we can be the type of species that can safely steward the power of exponential tech, i.e. 
we are moving into a phase where we have the ability to make artificial intelligence that is radically more capable than us of every finite game. And where we have the ability to synthesize new life, like the creation of new life, to destroy whole ecosystems, to make whole new biosystems. So we can't act like apex predators trying to beat the other guy and get ahead when we don't have the power of apex predators that like a really upset polar bear or orca can't destroy everything, right? We have something more like the power of nature or the power of gods. How do we become safe stewards of it? So that's the stuff that I focus on. That's the context because uh, the catastrophes currently are impending on a, a short timeline, not a very long timeline. So Nora and I were going to have a conversation about, um, well, I don't know, but including things like parenting and education and how we raise children, how we, how we develop people. And the context of the current world situation is a really important part of thinking about that, right? Because if we're raising kids for a relatively stable future that's a lot like the past, uh, there's one way to think about what development should look like. If we're raising kids for a radically different future where both, what, <clears throat> how do they deal with types of change that are unpredictable, that um, can completely change the type of world they can expect, and what capacities would we want to develop in them that they can help actually design and build those new world systems is a really, it's a, it's a context for parenting and education that is kind of requisite now and was never even a reasonable consideration in the past. Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> the idea that, that the older generation prepares the younger generation to um, be something like well adapted to their world um, puts us squarely in obsolescence right now. So if we are in, going to repeat those previous generations endeavors to, to help our children to get better jobs, to go through school, to get better grades so they can be optimized participants in the existing systems, we have failed them in the preparation that they are going to need to actually respond emotionally, intellectually, physically, um, spiritually, psychologically to the changes in the world around them. I think some of us are already seeing this in our kids where, you know, between looming threats of nuclear war and climate change and coronavirus, our kids are not um, blind to what's happening. They're holding things and, and already there's a tension around how do we talk to them about this. Uh, let alone, you know, as a parent, I, you know, it's my job if it's raining to be sure that my kids are ready for the rain. I give them their raincoat and their boots to put on. I make sure they've had their breakfast. I help them do their homework. I get them. And, and beyond that, there are a million messages in everything I say and do that have to do with how you are going to become in the world around us, how we have collectively made sense of what it is to be successful, to be well adapted, to be a good person, to be a bad person, right? To be um, any kind of person. What's a person, even? So, um, now I grew up in, in a household that was um, odd. It was an odd household. Um, and my father, uh, Gregory Bateson, who uh, did a lot of studies um, on, you know, actually, you know, helped sort of bring systems thinking into the world and cybernetics and many forms of information technology, lots of stuff in ecology and, and psychology and anthropology, was fascinated with this question of how is it that we are perceiving the world and how does our perception of the world inform the way that we create communication and response and community 
what's in that perception and how does it inform all of that. So this sounds like it's this intellectual realm, and it is. There's all sorts of fantastic work that you can read on this. But I was a kid. So when he was teaching me about these ideas, he didn't teach them to me as intellectual endeavors. This teaching came to me as breakfast, as how you walk through the woods and you pay attention to which organisms are in relationship to which other organisms. It came to me in the, the, the way you phrase a question, how you look into the relationships of a room before you respond. And so I grew up in a different world. And on top of that, it was the 70s, it was Northern California, we were living at Esalen and all these other crazy places, and in those spaces, there was this um, there was an identified urgency. In that, in that era, it was more like shaking off the bullshit of the 50s. The, the, the really ossified roles and, you know, what's a woman, what's a man, what's work, what's, right? Um, and breaking free, set the humans free, free love, free thinking. Um, but in doing that, they threw out all the rules, not just some of them. And when they threw out all the rules, I wasn't always safe. So what... Uh, the environment that I was in was um, I think the most important thing that was happening was that I was watching adults learn. I was watching them not know what they were doing. And, and that was really important because it, that was the modeling, the second order modeling. That, that I carried with me. It wasn't what they learned, but that they were learning. And that they really desperately were in pain from the way they had learned to be in the world and letting go of those shackles. I remember listening to grown-ups in the seminar, in the seminar rooms at Esalen banging on pillows. And they were trying to let it all out, you know? And they were like, I hate my mother and I hate this world and I hate... And we, the kids of Esalen, we would be outside the door and we would mock them. And it would be our mother in there, right? And we'd be like, I hate my mother, I hate this world. And, but we were just, you know, we were, what else could we do, right? You have to mock this. It was ridiculous. They're punching pillows with tennis rackets. Um, but they were ripping the, the fabric of expectations in society, and that's important. And that was a really interesting world to be in because it was a world that didn't have rules. The rules were ripping. There weren't new ones yet. How about your world? I just am um, reflecting that... Um they, they probably didn't know at the time that a little while later, roughly this time, we would look back at those few years that they grew up in post-World War II as the golden era that we really wish we could get back to, where, <laughs> where a single father working one job could buy a house, mm. and which hasn't been true in the US since, and increasingly less so, and which the average you know, the median income and the median cost of a house actually worked out in a short number of years, and um, there weren't mass shootings and uh, on and on. And, um, you know, I, I think I also grew up with parents who oriented to the rebellious, progressive, visionary side and pretty much thought of all tradition and orthodoxy as just all the dumb shit we've done so far that makes no sense that we need to rethink of from scratch. So, of course, a big part of my process was realizing all the aspects of tradition and orthodoxy that turned out the way they were for some good reasons. Um, <clears throat> which doesn't mean all good reasons, of course. The, the 
metacrisis I'm looking at is largely the result of where it's not a functional system. But um, I remember uh, when I first met Brett Weinstein, we had a very interesting conversation about the sexual revolution of the counterculture movement where he shared a perspective that then I've heard many people share since. It was the first time I heard it with him, uh, maybe about a eight or so years ago, from an evolutionary biologist, anthropologist perspective on why the uh, sexual revolution was net profoundly destructive when that, along with the civil rights movement and women's liberation and the environmental movement, were all things that I held as liberating type structures. And it was just interesting. And this other perspective I'm going to share quickly is not true. It's a part of the truth, but it's in, important to understand the balance. Um, the perspective that he was sharing, which I think a lot of uh, traditional people would share, is that the system of uh, kind of obligate institutional monogamy was something that had emerged as the dominant system because it worked much better than all of the other systems at a society level. And that specifically, uh, from an evolutionary biologist's point of view, he's like, men in a society will do whatever it is that they have to do to mate. And if the society guards mating in particular ways, they're basically developing how men are, are going to behave. And if a guy can't have sex until marriage, and in order to get married, he has to actually get not just the woman who he's interested in to say yes, but the parents and the preacher. And at the community wedding, it'll say if anyone here objects, which means if he's really been an asshole to anyone secretly, they can object, means not only can he not marry, but he can't get laid. That the, that it's binding his ability to get laid to his ability to have people who don't have an oxytocin rush associated with him think that he'll be a good father and a good provider and a good citizen. And that there was a lot of wisdom in that. And that as soon as, and this is a place where physical technology changes culture, as soon as birth control decoupled sex from procreation, so the consequence of sex became a lot less in terms of the actual consequence. And then the cultural movement because if you didn't have that, the cultural movement wouldn't have happened, right? So then the cultural movement was able to say, hey, we can rethink this thing from scratch. We have fundamentally new capacities. Let's rethink the premises. One of the things that happened was, and it seemed like a liberation that women could make choices themselves, but then that also meant make choices based on oxytocin dynamics that were not coupled to wisdom and long-term thinking where guys could be assholes but have game be good at getting laid, and it created an evolutionary niche for assholes to get laid, and that Reagan followed, and uh, prostitutes in blow, and then the pickup artist movement. And his whole argument was none of that would have happened had you not had the sexual revolution movement. Now, <laughs> there, <laughs> there is... Take a moment and laugh, because <laughs> you should. <laughs> um, and I think the point that it brings up to me that is interesting associated with what you started with on continuity and discontinuity and then generational transfer is maybe one of the deepest cultural dialectics is the traditional versus the progressive focus. Most of the time, a focus that orients more towards the continuity of traditions is what we think of as the political right. It's more conservative and changing stuff and one that orients more towards some idea of progress and novelties associated with the political left. Um, and they're supposed to be in a mutually respectful dialectic because they each hold part of the truth. But uh, from a very early left orientation that didn't understand that dialectic, the, the learning of the value of the traditional side for me was one way of thinking about the traditional or conservative side is that it is actually like has a deeper unconscious respect for evolutionary process mm -hmm. saying that the systems that have worked for a long time were the ones that made it through wars made it through famines made it through cultural revolutions there were a lot of things that didn't work the ones that worked probably have a bunch of embedded wisdom that we don't understand if we change it we might break them for reasons we don't understand so the the conservative sociologist brings up Chesterton's fence all the time, right? Chesterton's fence is the idea that before you take a fence down, be 100% sure or pretty sure that you understand all the reasons the fence was put up. 
and you might superficially think there was one reason the fence was put up, and you say that's no longer relevant, and you take it down, you find out there were 20 other reasons. And so in a way, you can say the traditional side actually being more aligned with the recognition of uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty, which is not feeling certain that the idea that we have of how to make it better is good. Right, that it might actually be naive and dumb and mess stuff up, so let's keep the things that at least show some sign of stability. And I think they wouldn't describe it that way, usually. And then, of course, from an evolutionary perspective, the progressive side says, yes, and, because we do have novelty, the thing that worked in the past, of course, can't work, and so we do have to innovate. And the dialectic is, let's make sure we understand, let's really endeavor to understand with a lot of benefit of the doubt and respect why the traditional systems have been selected for and try to understand all the wisdom that isn't obvious as opposed to a quick rejection of it. And then let's see where it isn't fit for purpose. Let's see where it is and where it isn't and where it isn't. How do we add things that have congruency with the parts that are fit, right? So this is the balance of continuity and discontinuity or tradition and progress. Yeah. I think one of the ways in which I have been um, really focusing on that lately is uh, this visitation um, I had recently to Japan. And um, while I was in Japan, I went to see some artisans that were there. And I was introduced to a, a family that was making incense and a family that was doing fabric making and a family that was making paper. And these families had been doing these things for 350 years, 750 years, 1,250 years. And um, that's continuity. And, but in order to do that, they had to make changes. Now, it, this was interesting to me because I, the work that I do, I'm also several generations in. And I have battled with that, right? I, when I was you know, young, people would introduce me and they would forget to say my name. And they would say, this is Gregory Bateson's daughter. And I'd be like, my name's Nora, hi. Um, but I fought for some sort of individuation because individuation was the tradition of my time. Okay, so this is, a, this is an interesting problem when individuation is the tradition. And that individuation, in fact, was very difficult for me. Everywhere I went, I could never not be Gregory Bateson's daughter, and I still couldn't be Gregory Bateson. So I was always letting everybody down. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly be either. Um, so it's taken me a long time to actually um, begin to hold this multi-generational work that I'm in. And to hold it in a way uh, that allows for the difference that the, the context that I'm working in as a woman in 2022 at you know, Nov with Daniel and you guys is really different than where my father was in 1972 um, or where his father was in 1902. All of us have been talking about the same ideas about how context and environments help change and shift organisms. Basically, the, everything we're talking about has been there for three generations, at least. So one thing is, is that in the past, there was this oppression of the family, where the first, you know, you had to do what your family did. And, and that was oppressive. You had to take on that, that, that career. You had to, you were limited by those sexual options. You were limited by those spiritual or religious options. And, um, and so getting free from the family was really important because it allowed for this beginnings of all these new ideas and ways of living. Um, and then here we are. And it's gotten very messy. And I have kids. 
I have uh, two kids that came from my womb, and my husband's got four kids, and they, you know, are two different cultures, Swedish and American kids. And they range in age from 16 to 29. And uh, how do I help them to be in the world right now uh, in a way that allows them to be in relationship with the past, in all of the goodness and all of the flaws, and allows them to begin to nurture a kind of flexibility for what their future will be. I don't think there's any generation that knows how to deal with what's coming. I mean, you can, like you were asking about how would you, if you were a mother in Ukraine five years ago, what did you teach your children? Um, and uh, so this is, I think, a very serious question of how do we teach our kids something that we actually don't know? And it puts, it puts us in a difficult relationship with that role of parent. Um, you know, your kid's failing math. Well, you have to do well in math. Why? Um, that question's getting harder and harder to answer, actually. Um, I, I, and, you know, I think for me, with my kids, I, first of all, I, I, I was pulled out of school and homeschooled for, I think, three, four years of my uh, life. My father had cancer, and when my father had cancer, we moved to Big Sur, California, and the school was really far away, and I used to just throw up on the bus. So he said, why don't you just come? I only have a little time left, just be here. And so I was homeschooled, and it was really unstructured. There was no such thing as homeschooling then. It was actually called truancy at that point. Um, and it was chargeable by law, in fact. It was illegal, but nevertheless, we got away with it. And we did math. We would have these conversations about math. We'd take walks in the forest, and he would tell me the Latin names of everything and how it reproduced, and I would travel with him, and I would sit in on his workshops. And I was at Esalen, and Joseph Campbell was there talking about mythology, and Alan Watts was there talking about you know, religion, and Carl Rogers was talking about psychology, and I got, I got a pretty good education for a 10-year-old, you know? Um, but then I went back to school. My dad died, and I went back to school. And it was like hell. I mean, I have to tell you that even the memory of those, those first moments of going back into the classroom, it was like everything beautiful in the world just ran out of the room. They, all the subjects were divided. And math was no longer fun. I was like writing papers for my father's college classes on how to think in base five. And and because he was teaching university classes on perception. So he was just going to get his nine-year-old daughter to write a paper on how to think in base five. Perfectly reasonable, right? And then I went into, you know, ninth grade math, and I was like, this is horrible. This isn't fun, this isn't groovy, this is, I think I barely got by with a C. And I never wanted to do math again. But um, I had this experience of what it could be, what education could be. And so when I had kids, I took them out of school. We were moving from California to Vancouver, Canada, and so, my California legal world kind of thought I was going to Canada, and the Canadian world thought we were still moving. And at that point, my husband, their father at the time, he's still their father, my husband at the time, their father. Um, and we just were like, OK, let's go. And so we essentially stole our children <coughs> from the system. I imagine this might sound a little radical to you. Um, we stole our children, and we went on this fantastic adventure. It was an incredible privilege. We went down into South America, and we went and we we learned another. We we went to a, a language class in Cusco, Spanish intro to Spanish with just the family. 
So it was intergenerational language learning. Hmm. And we were all at the beginning. And so we got to see how each other learned. That was just fascinating. So my kids could see, you know, ways in which I was struggling and I could ask them for help. And they they could see, you know, my husband get irritated that some, you know, it was really a very interesting experiment. What year? What year? Mm, that would have been 2005 or 6. Yeah. Why? And it just um I just think it's fun hearing that part of the story when I finished my uh, undergrad. I took a one-way plane ticket to Peru <clears throat> and landed in Cusco and started with a week immersion class. And uh, what year? That would have been two thousand one. Ah. So not a lot of hard part. That would have been a funny coincidence. Yeah. Um, so so we pulled the kids out of school for six months. That was the idea. And um, when we 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 did a, an hour of reading and an hour of writing. They could write whatever they wanted. And I had these little math workbooks. I did an hour of math with them every once in a while, not every day. Well, when we got back, I couldn't put them back in the school because they were two years ahead. And I wasn't even remotely trying to get them ahead. Actually, I was just, we were just traveling and, and having this amazing trip. But I just wanted to be sure that I could, you know, that we weren't losing any ground and, you know, I couldn't put them back in. And then we had another problem. So we thought, well, okay, uh, what we need to do is stall. So we took another six months to finish out the school year and I, I actually hired a tutor because I didn't have any more time to do this. It takes a lot of time to be that person. And so this tutor was a, a, a former teacher who had gotten glaucoma and gone blind. And so they had a blind tutor, and he, they, the project was just spend the next six months reading a few Shakespeare plays. So they went line by line through Macbeth, through Midsummer Night's Dream, through Richard III, and oops, that accidentally made it much worse. Because in fact, they, and then they learned poetry, they learned history, they learned psychology, they learned about all this different stuff and it was actually a very systemic education. They were, they were comparing the, the great soliloquies with um, famous speeches by Martin Luther King or by Hitler or by, right? They were comparing soliloquies in Shakespeare with, with, with historical figures. Um, and then I put them back in school. As I was thinking about this, I was talking to my daughter who's now 27, and, I, and she said to me the other day, she and her husband-to-be have been reading parenting books, and she's like, every single one of them is about how your child is going to be well-adjusted. What if you don't want your child to be well-adjusted to a sick society? right? What if the systems we're in are destroying the possibility of their future and being well-adjusted to them only makes that happen? How do you get your child unadjusted to this, is the question. She said the one regret that she had was that we stopped homeschooling. But it was her that begged for it. She longed, longed for the TV experience of the prom dress and the lockers and the boyfriends and the gossip and the parties and the, you know, this ridiculous thing she had seen in Hollywood, which of course turned out to be soul-crunching, you know, bullying, mind-dividing, you know, welcome to the world of reductionism mess. That's kind of what happened in my house. <laughs> uh, there's so many interesting directions that I'd like to go with it. Um, you mentioned briefly something that we talked about on our walk of if you were a parent in Kiev 10 years ago uh, who was progressive and thinking about the future of the world and thinking about how to parent thoughtfully and does my kid go to Waldorf or Montessori or do I unschool, <clears throat> you probably weren't thinking about preparing them for imminent war because that didn't seem like uh, a likely reality because we haven't had that in a long time. 
And I think when you study the history of civilizational collapse, when the Roman Empire fell or the Ottoman Empire fell or the Mayan or the Egyptian, they fall after having been in place for so long that the memory of collapse isn't even in anyone's memory. It just feels like myth. So it feels like, of course, this will be here forever. And um, so if you knew that was going to happen, how would you prepare your kids is a really interesting question. But if you don't know if it's going to happen through, like in Syria, a drought where all the subsistence farmers have to move somewhere else and then they have to try to find jobs in a city where there aren't enough jobs, it leads to factionizing and resource war versus it actually means shelling is going to start versus how do you prepare kids for a world that you can't anticipate what the world is? You have to prepare them for the capacity to notice what is happening that might be salient and then to figure out what capacities might be relevant that they don't currently have and then how to rapidly develop them and how to keep doing that, which is a really interesting thing to try to prepare somebody for. Um, and yet I would say like Kiev as a canary in a coal mine is true for everybody currently because the an educational system is embedded inside of a civilizational system where the civilization functions a certain way. So you are training kids to grow up and be able to fulfill the functions of a society and the workforce. Independent of civilizational collapse, uh, technological unemployment itself portends this changing in the lives of the next generation of every, everybody. Because you were saying, the kid asks, why should I be good at math? And it's a harder question to answer. Obviously, it was so important to be trained in the abacus until it wasn't, right? And then the calculator changes what we think, and the so important to be trained in the slide rule or the compass. And then with GPS, does anyone need to know about maps or compasses? Or And then you're like, well, we're becoming technologically dependent. But well, we've always been technologically dependent, just earlier technologies. You take away early people's stone tools, and they're dead, right? And the unique thing about humans is that we were not selected for based on the capacity of our bodies. The human body in every environment without tools dies. What we were selected for was the capacity to do this recursive abstraction and make tools and do division of labor and coordination. So the unit of selection for sapiens is a coordinating group with its coordination protocols and its full tech stack um, because a single person with a spear can't hunt a mastodon, and a bunch of people without spears can't either, right? It's a bunch of people with spears and their coordination that can. And so it's like from the beginning, what was actually selected for in humans was a civilizational complex. And so then, like, we don't train people at spear throwing, even though throughout all of human history it was the most important skill. And of course, if we lose some of the current tech stack, older stuff might become a relevant skill. But then in the presence of, and AI is different than every tech we've ever had, right? Because previously we figured out a capacity we wanted and developed a tool for it. AI has the ability to not just do a capacity we want it to do, but to figure out all of the other capacities and develop them faster than we can become aware of it. So you think about math, GPT-3 already has, which is a, an open, language model that uh, OpenAI built that anybody can go access. You can just speak to it in natural language. It understands and does stuff. And so you can say, GPT-3, write me a research paper that cites real research on why vaccines are dangerous or why vaccines are safe or whatever it is, and it'll generate that output. And so you can also say, um, not just solve this math problem for me, but figure out what math is even relevant to solve this real world problem and just give me the answer to the real world problem. So then there's this huge question of in, uh, and now this relates back to the tradition versus progress. The traditional wisdom becomes less relevant the faster the rate of change in the actual world happens. And the, so if you look at say, highly conserved traditions in indigenous cultures, their technological rate of change was quite slow. So the life of a great grandparent and the life of the great great grandchild were much more similar. And obviously we've been dealing with post-industrial revolution, these radical changes where what it means to be adaptive is a completely different world system, new tools. The singularity is when 
new tool happens that you can't be adaptive without, like cell phones and you know, whatever, there's a the society has to completely adjust to a whole set of capacities are irrelevant and a whole new set are required. When you start getting many of those within a single generation, and when you start getting them faster than anyone can adapt, what does that world look like? And specifically, how do you raise kids? How do you do education in a world where robotics and AI are going to obsolete all the jobs, almost all the jobs, and can do most everything that we would typically train a human to do better than humans can? And you have to say, fuck, what, what is the, when, when humans providing a utility to society through a, some specialist trained task is not relevant anymore because you can make robots and AI that do almost everything better than humans do, what is the purpose of human life? And that's a, either terrifying if you don't change some deep things because it ends up looking like a radical unemployed underclass and you know obsolescence, or it looks like something really incredible where those jobs that robotics and AI can do better are the ones that you have to pay people to do because they don't want to do. You have to extrinsically incent them because the things that we're intrinsically motivated to do involve novelty and connection, which are the things that the robotics and the AI don't do as well. And so then to get to say, all right, well, what would it look like to have a civilization system and then an education system that had the resources to really train people to the thing that they're intrinsically motivated to anyways? Just a few thoughts that come to mind. I'm reminded of this friend of mine. Um, and uh, she had a good friend who entered a beauty pageant. And you know how in the beauty pageant they have the, the, the gown thing, and then they have the bikini thing, and then they have to talk, right? There's some interview. Well, she was the first person to be in the interview part. And they asked her the question, if you were a parent, what would you teach your child? But she misheard it. And what she heard was, if you were a parrot, what would you teach your child? And so she made the response, it's probably the best parenting advice ever, which is, I would teach them how to catch worms and how to fly. <laughs> and, you know, actually it's pretty good. <laughs> um, because in a way that is what we need to do, is um, be careful about the flexibility of that. Um, and, and the other thing is, it's not just parent-child. I really want to hold that in this room, that when we're talking intergenerational, we're also talking the elders. Um, I'm, I'm right now living three generations in the house. And it's, um, let me tell you, it's not easy, actually. And it's, it's not easy because all of us have been trained to be in a world in which our education, our profession, our identity has been about our individual success, not being a burden, not needing each other. We have been taught to not need each other. And successful parenting is making a child that doesn't need you. OK? So my mother is also suffering from the same epistemological glitch. And she feels, as a 94-year-old, that she shouldn't need me to take care of her, that she is a burden if I, if she needs me. Um, but this is a fantastic ripoff because since she's been in my house, I have learned more about how to live and incidentally how I don't want to live, okay? Because this is something that our parents can teach us, not just how to live and what wisdom they have, but also what we definitely don't want to repeat. And there it is. That's the continuity and the discontinuity. And I am so grateful for the ways in which she has taught me not to live. Um, and as she gets ready to leave her body, um, what I'm doing with my days right now, when I tend her wounds and I make her food, it's a lot of work, you know. 
um, is I'm actually making a home for her inside me for when she leaves her body. Mm. That's what I'm doing. It looks like I'm making a home for her in my house. Mm. But when she goes, she doesn't go, does she? Mm. She's still living in me. What room is she living in? Is she living in a room of resentment? How do I tend that habitation? Um, and, and then when I start to do that, I'm also paying attention, woohoo, like, how are my kids doing with this? What sort of a, what sort of a house am I inhabiting inside their world? Um, and paying attention to what's happening in this intergenerational fabric. Because I cannot carry with me into this uncertain future. The, the burden, okay, there's the burden, the burden of that resentment that I have. I can't bring it with me. I don't have it, I can't right now. We have other things to do. So anything I can do between now and the time she leaves her body to tend that, and I don't really know what that means. Nobody ever taught me how to do that. I don't know what the heck that means. But it's really important work for how, how I go on when she's gone. Um, Something that you said that uh, brings up a, a, a couple of thoughts that um, I find really interesting. I, why in the wealthy industrialized world, <clears throat> the nuclear family home is the almost universal default setting when uh, intergenerational family was historically for a very long time and for the m majority of human history and our, what we're genetically adapted to, a tribe was. And it's really interesting to get that for the entirety of human history, there were, n nobody ever lived outside of a band or a tribe. <clears throat> and so we actually have evolved and are genetically fit for um, very, very deep dependence and interconnection with about that many people right, 50 to 150 type people. Um, and then it, it's so interesting how all the, how many intentional community projects fail and the default setting goes back to nuclear family. And one way of looking at it is, you know, Sartre said hell is other people. And that having to compromise on anything, how the house is decorated, the cleanliness of it, who has the chores, what's on TV, anything is just such a pain in the ass. We, If we have the optionality, we go to not having to deal with those things. But then everybody is lonely and they watch other people on TV and they look at other people on social media and they're on ubiquitous antidepressants and yet still don't want to actually deal with the pain in the ass of other people. And the only people that they will live with is where the bonding energy of sex holds them together or the progeny, the out, the, the byproduct of sex. And that's what the nuclear family is. Like anything less than the bonding energy of sex or children is not enough bonding energy to deal with how much we don't want to have to deal with other people. And yet ubiquitous depression, anxiety, loneliness, meaninglessness, lack of connection happens. And it's, it's fascinating because we have to actually get over that. And it's obviously a very difficult thing to get over. Um, and especially to get over it without getting caught back in these old oppressive versions of it. So that to me is the, the, the movement here of, of how we're doing intergenerational living, but we're not doing it in the way it got done before because that became oppressive in a bad way. Um, yeah, and, and I'm thinking about how these, these learnings of what world we live in are, are in the little, the little bits of every day. So for me, this is always about like, who's gonna do the dishes? But this is a serious evolutionary question. It could be that the entire question of whether or not our species makes it is 
based on who's going to do the dishes. I mean, I'm actually only kind of kidding, because we cannot have community until we can commune, period. We can't, all these lovely projects of how to create sustainability and this and that and how to remodel the world, we can't do that if we can't need each other and be needed. It's, it's not going to happen. Like there's, there's no amount of modeling and, and working toward making a rule set that we're going to live within if we can't commune. Um, and so, so we were talking about this earlier, the dishes. So in a lot of households, what you get is you get a chore wheel or you get a, you know, um, who's going to do what when. Commun you know, intentional communities are famous for this, this sort of, uh, articulation of how everyone's going to sh produce their responsibility and participate in the things that have to get done, the toilets have to get cleaned, the food has to get made, the dishes have to get done, etc. Um, and we had a, this retreat recently at, at my house with these people that have been doing warm data with me and we had this moment where it was like, well, let's make the chore wheel. It's like, no, what if we just don't? What if we actually just leave that to the need to pay attention to the relationships in the group? 40 people in a group, that's a lot of dishes. So what if we just did that? And um, it, because I had been, you know, with my own kids thinking about, well, if I teach them that it's important to do the dishes on Wednesday, I have taught them to look at this abstracted version of what makes responsibility. If I take the time to teach them to pay attention to the relationships in the room, who needs to do the dishes tonight is not really about whether it's Wednesday. It's about who's tired. It's about who's busy. It's about who's upset who did you know there's a whole lot of information in the room about this but we don't teach our children to pay attention to that relational information we teach them that wednesday is the day that they do the dishes and that is an obscuring now that teaching is not easily produced this was something my dad did with me all the time where he would articulate Okay, so I'm making this decision because I'm looking at these relationships. And so because I'm looking at these relationships, I think da 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 Or I'm learning about, but he did a lot of actually vocalizing for me what he was learning, the way he was seeing, the way he was putting together his response. And that takes time. It also takes mutual respect. Yeah, it's interesting. The um, the structured rule set obviously isn't teaching them how to assess the environment and to take responsibility and to communicate. And um, but I'm going to argue for it for a moment. Um, the it, it's a relationship between. Um, virtue ethics, utilitarian ethics, and deontological ethics in terms of the philosophical way to think of it. Um, and I never could make a good argument for deontological ethics, i.e. rule-based systems, that the best choice is based on kind of rule-based systems. It just, that seemed like what you do if you assume that everyone is too dumb to figure shit out for themselves. And otherwise, you want a balance between virtue and utilitarian ethics. Virtue ethics being what is intrinsically right regardless of what's going to come from it, and utilitarian ethics saying, well, let's think through what's going to come from it and try to make sure we're thinking through cause and effect well. And of course, we can't think through it perfectly, so we have to also factor what just seems intrinsically right and balance those. So I was always down with the balance of virtue ethics and utilitarian ethics. The, <clears throat> the argument for deontological ethics, and the Jews actually make this argument quite well in the kind of Talmudic tradition, is that the system that you're describing of where your dad explained his choice-making process out loud, so you were getting to get all of the nuance and context, works at small scale. Mm. 
and works for people who got that level of development. And evolutionarily, humans, in the same way I said, like, right in, in the current context, the default setting is nuclear families. Um, before the plow, the default setting was a sub Dunbar number tribe, right? And it would never get bigger than the Dunbar number, which was so fascinating, right? That as soon as it would get roughly bigger than give or take 150, it would always cleave. And so there was similarly something that made that the stable state. And a huge part of it was, as soon as it gets bigger than that, you can't actually have a single conversation that everyone can participate in. Both because without microphones, you can't, you just literally can't hear each other across a huge space. You can't track that many people to say, is everyone pulling their share in the way that you can with 40 people? And you just literally can't take enough time to hear everybody's views back and forth with a thousand people to decide what to do, timely enough to decide what to do. So if you got larger than that number, some people had to have their life subject to the choices that other people made that they didn't get to have a say in. And they're like, no, fuck that. I'd go, rather go be part of a smaller group where I get a say in the thing. So it's so interesting. And then we only started to get larger groups when you, we had populated so much that tribal warfare started to become ubiquitous. And in the presence of things like tribal warfare, uh, if another larger group is going to come... <laughs> If another larger group is going to come attack us, then a couple groups will unify for survival purposes, in which case we'll sacrifice some of that autonomy and freedom for security, which we can see has been a trend since. But in very, very large systems where we, I can't actually make good choices about something that involves six continent supply chains in something that involves division of labor that has thousands or millions of people like I can't see all of it to factor and internalize all of it so we subdivide it into categories and we make rules and so the rule-based system is the idea that you have people like judges and people like specialists who are way way more uh, spending all their life thinking about these issues and actually embedding some wisdom into the rules so that people who don't understand all of that complexity and or where it's beyond the complexity that anyone can understand can at least be able to participate with the system. And so how do you, and yet we also know that as soon as the context changes, the rules aren't right anymore. And we also know that those who get in the position to make them have their own vested interests and corruption and blah, blah, blah. So we can see why the rule-based systems have actually succeeded because of scale. And so then a question of in societies that can't just move back to small scale because at a tribal scale you can't produce your own laptops and you're not going to move off of laptops and still be um, relevant in the direction of the future and you have to have six continent supply chains but you cannot possibly see all the effects. How do you do very, how do you do the very high context choice making thing, not have rules and yet be able to factor that scale? I would say this is one of the huge questions we have to face of how do we get tribal level bonding beyond the tribe and actually at a fully global scale? I think that what, this is what we're having this conversation really about because it, it seems to me that the the learning and the habit of that kind of perception starts at home. And if, if you don't have the habit of even trying that perception, if you've already, you know, been, had the, the training wheels on the bicycle, you know, to say that you, you're going to learn how to do dishes because you're going to do them on Wednesday, right? right? This is, this is minutia. This is granular stuff. But the perceiving of systemic relational complex processes in the kitchen extend to the possibility of being able to see them in other places at different you know scales in different sizes um, and so I think for me this is where I feel like it's not the answer I don't think it's the answer but what it is is um, this question of how are we going to al allow these next generations to actually perceive the world differently so they can respond differently, so they can actually help make it different in ways that actually I don't know that we can even generate the ideas for.
because we're so deeply informed by the structures that we have been within. I have a couple thoughts on that, but I think he said five minutes. So is this, should we wrap? Two, two more thoughts? Yes. Okay, yeah. two more thoughts. So you're mentioning um, when you were homeschooled, how much further ahead you got, and when your kids were homeschooled, how much further ahead they got, even though they didn't have, and not just even though, but specifically because they didn't have formal curriculum, that when the kids were just reading Shakespeare, they, because it was a small environment with a tutor and they got to ask questions, which you can't do in a class of 30 people, um, why did he pick that word? And you get into etymology and then what is that reference? And you get into the culture of that time, you get into history, you get a much more curiosity-driven system, and the curiosity-driven system means um, people tend to become good at anything they really are fascinated by and love. So when you get to have a curiosity-driven system, the kids just become much more voracious learners, and you get to have a much more interconnected system where the kid isn't memorizing stuff, they're learning stuff that is directly interesting, so they just naturally remember it. Um, and you're saying what happens around how we wash dishes and how we make choices is already that. Every kid is being homeschooled in addition to being schooled based on however the parents are operating, the kids are learning how to be human based on that process. So a thing that I find so interesting, there's a, um, there's a paper I found a couple years ago that if people are interested, I, I will share in some, uh, maybe with this group here, on uh, a historical study of the statistical precursors of super genius was the name of the article. And so it was, and we're not, I'm not saying that this particular assessment of what a desirable human is is the only um, definition, but it was specifically looking at polymathic super genius, people who contributed insights to fields that the specialists didn't across many, many fields long term. And specifically, it was also looking at the idea that we have much less of them now than we did historically, that uh, Richard Feynman said he thought he would be the last generation of great physicists. And a lot of people have this assessment that there just have not been profound breakthroughs in physics like there were, you know, him and, you know, pre that from, from kind of Newton on. And some people say, no, that's not, like, one answer to why do we not have super genius of the same level that we had during uh, the Enlightenment up through, say, modern physics, one answer is uh, we do, we just only appreciate it posthumously. One answer is we already got all the easy stuff and now it's just too hard and it takes groups of people with AI and data processing. But there's actually a really good argument that we aren't developing people as well as we're developed at the peak, not the average, but at the peak. And there is an assessment. It's a very third rail topic of why. And the answer is that the super geniuses were almost all the result of aristocratic tutoring. Mm -hmm. And this study was first found out in the West by Charles Sanders Peirce, the great, mm -hmm. arguably the greatest logician uh, of the 20th century and the founder of semiotics. And he was trying to figure out why he was able to formalize all these fields better than the specialists in the field. What about his learning style made that happen? So he looked at the super geniuses of the past to see are there any statistical correlations. He was trying to look at anything from genetics to culture to unique aspects of childhood and the thing that really popped out the most and then a hundred studies have found the same thing is that the people who had that and you see this with Wittgenstein you see this with Newton there they were born into aristocracy where they had exceptionally good tutors not a traditional educational system and like one of the Dalai Lama is a great example Right? If you're the Dalai Lama, the best lamas in Tibet are tutoring you in not only all of Buddhist wisdom and history and politics and culture, but how to be a human. And you're like, yeah, I mean, I think anybody could be the Dalai Lama if they had that tutoring, but that's, you can't democratize that, right? There's, and you read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, and Marcus Aurelius was kind of, you know, the closest thing to a philosopher king maybe the world has had. And the whole first chapter he dedicates to his tutors. And you're like, why did he do that? And it's because when you're being raised in the height of the Hellenistic period to be the emperor of Rome, the top mathematician in all of Rome is your private tutor as a kid, and the top poet, and the top historian, and the top... And you're like, well... You... And then this brings up a real interesting question. There's another study I saw on um, 
world-class mathematicians, and it said what is in common to be a world-class mathematician, because it's so commonly been thought mathematical logic is IQ is genetic, and it doesn't actually correlate all that well. The highest statistical correlator for a world-class mathematician that they, when we looked at people who were defined in a particular way as world-class mathematician, that they had in common is that they ended up studying with a world-class mathematician while they were young. Mm -hmm. And the insight is, and you could say, well, they only got that opportunity because they already had proclivity, but that isn't actually kind of what happens. It's that accidentally they got into this environment. You can't learn to think like a world-class mathematician from a normal high school math teacher who doesn't think like that. So you can learn how to do math, but you can't learn how to think math. You can't learn how to think poetry from someone who doesn't have that. So then this science actually got very suppressed because it was super third rail because when we wanted to get away from feudalism and the aristocracy and democratize things, you can't actually democratize this. And, or that was the idea. It's like everyone can't have Marcus Aurelius as teachers, right? Like one, a very small number of people could. And what's so interesting is even when you come up to the Feynman topic, von Neumann and Einstein both had mathematician governesses as little kids, where who was taking care of them at home were mathematicians mm -hmm. when they were little before they even went to public school, and this thing holds. And so then I started to look at my childhood, and Nora and I had this of like, I was homeschooled, and I didn't have Marcus Aurelius as tutors, but I had my parents, um, and their friends, who were also thinkers, engaging with me in the topics I was interested in all the time, which means that I had a curiosity-based, and the thing that my parents said that was really good was whenever I'd ask questions that they didn't know the answers to, they'd say, let's go figure it out, and let's go find the books and find the people that know it. So I'm like, okay, I got a ad hoc version of aristocratic tutoring that was enough for me to realize finding the right people to talk to is key. So I started seeking out great tutors. And relatively young, I started finding who were the top thinkers in the world in topics and figuring out how to get them to be teachers. And um, so something that I find very inspiring about this is that most of the studies we have on human potential that do statistical analysis um, it actually has nothing to do with human potential. That whether we're talking about being as compassionate and omni-considerate as the Dalai Lama, or as um, polymathic as von Neumann or Charles Sanders Peirce, those are developable, independent of, it's not a genetic thing, but it's, it's actually a developmental thing. So then the question of, could we actually make a society where that was possible widely? And there's a number of reasons why the answer in the past was totally not. Um, except tribal culture is different, but. The reason why it hasn't been is if you have to prepare most kids for the labor force mm -hmm. because the society needs that, it just doesn't make sense to educate them that way and we can't afford putting that much investment into teachers to do that thing. And the people who are the smartest you can't have being teachers because you need them to work in military manufacturing or in banking or in something like that. But as soon as you start thinking about technological obsolescence because of robotics and AI replacing us in the labor force and replacing most of those other faculties, um, can we have a much higher percentage of the total human workforce be things like educators and therapists and being focused on human development and get a radically higher level of training and then also restructure culture and family? And what you start to think about in terms of what we think is possible for average human intelligence and average human psychological capacity, I think can be radically reworked, which is something I find really inspiring. Me too. I think it's rattle, just radical and, and possible. Um, and just to close out, I just wanted to say one thing that you touched on that's really important is that these aptitudes and, and this greatness thing, um, whatever it is that you are learning to soak into the grain of your wood, okay, the hum of your song, that the thing that gets in, in you, that thing is not just for study. It actually plays into every single thing you do in a day. And so, you know, the fact that the governesses were mathematicians is really significant because it, this ties into the artisans of the, you know, 700, 900 year family gen intergenerational studies is that the thing that's been getting learned is not just learned while you're sitting there with the book, with the teacher. It's learned through all the whole day. It's in everything. So there's that. Um, let's give you guys a break. Hang out. 
have a conversation, generate a, some questions or thoughts, responses, con, you know, whatever comes up, and then we'll come back to this in how many minutes, Daniel? Let's meet again 20 minutes from okay. 12 o'clock. Okay, 20 minutes. Let's say 20 minutes. In 20 minutes. Yeah, so 8.20. 8.20, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, so um, you're free to share some thoughts and perspectives and, okay, yeah. yeah. So um, maybe, do you want to say something? <laughs> you said something interesting in the break. Maybe raise a question. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, you spoke a lot about teaching and being taught uh, between generations, uh, parents, children, uh, and uh, but uh, th don't you think there is um, knowledge in, um, in the newborn child? Uh, how much should we teach uh, and what should we teach and why? Yeah. I think that the biggest opportunity to avoid catastrophe is to activate our innate capacity to distinguish knowledge from opinion. And I don't think that's an intellectual thing or an academic thing. I think it's, I think it's something that every child is capable of doing. In the, in, the, in, the, in the basic sense, like, I know I'm in this room with you. But if you ask me who used chemical weapons in Syria, I don't know. I have an opinion, but it's different. I, I don't know that. And given the fact that half the population of the world is now under the age of 20, and that they're, gonna, they're already facing the metacrisis, and the grown-ups are incapable of dealing with it at, at present, and all of our institutions are dysfunctional, um, what are your thoughts about, about that relating to what you just said, You know, using how can we bring forth that innate learning capacity f that every child is born with to handle this? I mean, uh, practically in our educational policies and things like that. Hi. Um, I have two questions, and one is about, the, or both are about the meta crisis that you described in the beginning. And the first is very personal. It's how do you live with yourself, and how do you keep well mentally by seeing all this? Because most of us, I think, we know it, but we try just not to see it. And th the other question is, um, the road ahead, as you described, it is very dystopical. Um, and now we're talking more about a procedural way how to attack the problem. And as being theoretical, uh, do we see a vision of what could be or how it we a vision towards which we could go towards in the way of breaking the dystopic away? Yeah, hi. Um, you, uh, my, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel. You said that uh, we can't all have like at some point on the in the discussion about education. You talk, you talked about how we can't all have Marcus Aurelius tutors, but I think we might in five years or something when you've got GPT six or seven, perhaps who knows which iteration will break it. But at some point, that's also gonna revolutionize learning, probably. Maybe some thoughts on that. Thanks. Hello. I have a question. You talk about that we lack the wisdom of God, but we have this great technology. How do we attain the wisdom of God or the wisdom needed to give technology the right direction? Yeah. Yeah, so it seemed like uh, a thing that you both touched upon was paying attention. Uh, and, and that seems to be an important thing. And it occurred to me that uh, one. One of our fundamental, one of the fundamental things that we do as human beings is to pay attention. 
Uh, and is it worth paying attention to how we pay attention? Is that a skill that can be taught in isolation, or is this something that just happens uh, alongside other activities? So um, my 27-year-old daughter about three years ago, maybe it was four, called me up and she was in tears. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, Mom, I, I don't know how to be a good person. I can't figure it out. Because every single thing that I do connects me to the destruction and the exploitation, whether I am taking the bus or whether I, you know, am wearing clothes or, you know, going to the grocery store and getting granola, it doesn't matter what I do, everything I do links me into this thing that, you know, we're describing as the meta crisis. Um, and when your kid calls and says that, you can't brush that off. You can't just deliver some canned script. You know, oh honey, don't worry about it. You, know, you, you just can't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. It's not, you can't say that. When your kid calls and they're asking that question, you have to show up um, with no bullshit, actually. And so, you know, the only thing I knew to say was, keep asking the question. Keep asking that question and know that I'm asking the same question and I'm right here with you. And that we will work on this together, but we have no idea. Um, so in that sense, the, the the kid that really wants to be a good person. This is so important. She wants to be a good person. You know, you were saying the other night, I'll let you have your line, because it's such an incredible line. But um, what I think happened with her and it continues is that she has been in an ongoing conversation with me since she was this big that was a conversation about how are you perceiving the world? What do you see? What makes you see it like that? Where did you learn to see it like that? What if you saw it like this? So for me, the, the greatest learning happens in these moments when we begin to perceive our own perception. And, and most of the time, that happens in a way that's a little bit confusing. Um, you know, maybe it's culture mix-up, maybe it's a communication mix-up, maybe it's a whatever. But that moment when you begin to perceive your own perception, uh, and, and my kids were in it from pretty young. We started in talking about that stuff pretty young. They can handle it. They loved it. Um, but but a, lot of, a lot of breakfast tables don't have those conversations at them. So I think we're, we're kind of caught also in a limited understanding of what kind of conversations you can have with your children. And, um, and then there's, I think a lot of times, there's a, all kinds of developmental limitations that get assigned that aren't actually real. It's just that there's not a lot of households doing it. So you don't know. If you had a lot of households that were you know, doing epistemological stuff with their three-year-olds, four-year-olds, starting with language, right? Um, they're pretty good at it by the time they're eight. And that's a, a different sort of way. So that kind of moves through some of this. They, they can do it. It's there. This business of I am a perceiver <coughs> perceiving the world is, is in there. Um, if you help it give language, if it's held at the if it's held at the table, it's there. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so your daughter's question of how do I be a good person when to do anything in the world, I am to some degree complicit with the world system, and to not be complicit with the world system also involves not being able to really uh, affect it, um, which means I can't actually separate myself from the world that I live in to have my hands clean. I am a part of a world system, and that doesn't mean that I just go along with it, but it also means I can't be completely free of its sins, right? Like I am a part of this world system. It's just very interesting. Um, and it relates to the question that you asked <clears throat> about, um, you know, just how to emotionally process. And so that process, one of the big steps of where that started for me was I was nine and I saw a cattle truck from a factory farm taking animals from a factory farm to a slaughter. And you've seen the trucks that have the holes for air in the side. And I went over and I looked at it and the cow closest to me was missing an eye and blood was coming from it. And all the cows were in their feces and terrified. And, um, you know, it was like a Auschwitz train car or whatever. And um, I grew up eating meat without an understanding of what factory farms were and loving animals with that, you know, it, was just, I, it wasn't a cognitive dissonance because I didn't know better as a kid. And um, so I asked my parents because I was, I was shocked and horrified the way a kid would be. And uh, they said that's where meat comes from. And so I got Diet for a New America, read it, you know, that next day and then dove into PETA and... Uh, going to factory farms, and that was the beginning of kind of animal rights work, which then went from factory farms to then also looking at overfishing and looking at whaling, and then that brought environmental issues, and that brought the interconnected extreme poverty issues, and just kind of the whole thing started. But I remember starting with the factory farm thing and getting to see the scale of it, right? Getting to see uh, that there were more total biomass of animals in factory farms than there were in the wild and uh, you know all, all that kind of thing and the, that it's not like hunting it's not like an animal that has a natural life and then we kill it's like a continuity of torture and I it was the first time that I was suicidal because I didn't like the world just didn't make sense that my species could do that and feel okay about it and I couldn't be complicit with it right so I'm like like, fuck, I can't, this world feels like a crazy house to me, and I want out. And then it wasn't that hard to think through, if I kill myself, all the animals are still in the factory farms, and all the, all the kids starving to death, and all, blah, 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 all those things, I didn't change any of it, so it's like, that's an ultimately selfish move to get out of suffering myself, it's a vicarious suffering. So I'm like, okay, can't do that. Can my life feel like a success while that's still happening? Like that was a media question of if I focus on some things and can I know that there are other sentient beings that are in just utter trauma and torture and yet I'm stoked because my life is good. And I, I'm like, well, I would, have to, I would have to not know what I know and I already know it, so I'd have to pretend to not know. I'd have to actively disconnect, which would mean I would have to choose to be a sociopath. Right, I would have to choose to disconnect. And I'm like, all right, so the only way I can live in this world and just feel like my life is a success is as a sociopath. And it just doesn't work for me. I can't do that. I can't shut off what I know. So I'm like, all right, if... And, you know, this was very naive. This was nine years old. But I'm like, I have to end factory farms. If I end factory farms, the animals aren't in that condition. I didn't know the rest of the medical crisis yet. Um, I can live in a world where that's not the case. So I remember thinking, if I die and factory farms haven't ended, then I failed at living in a way that I could be okay with. And, you know, then that just expanded <laughs> from that to all the other issues. And, but what, what it did is say, I, um, I can't think about my life separate from life separate from the whole of all the things. And, you know, I wasn't 
born into extreme poverty in Sudan. I wasn't born with AIDS. I wasn't born into a factory farm. I could have been. I could easily be the consciousness on that side, and I can't take any merit for having been born on this side, but I can do a lot more to get animals out of factory farms than they can do for themselves. And so that feels obligate, right? But like a like an obligation I wouldn't want out of, like a sacred obligation. And um, and then the problem comes that I, I have no idea how to do it. And then the problem comes that I get some ideas and they totally don't work, right? And so there is a kind of existential devastation. And then if you pull yourself out of that, there is a naive optimism of how to possibly solve the things that will totally not work, right? The early activist ideas I had, of course, got shattered on the rocks of how much more vested interest and how much more complicated and how the solutions I had in mind didn't factor a million of the causal dynamics involved. And, <clears throat> um, and so then back to existential angst, <laughs> devastation. But then the only answer is understand the problem better to know how to contribute to what might be adequate solutions better. And, um, and I remember at being like, okay, so the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, we'll try to benefit things. So I'll stop eating meat that comes from factory farms, I'll stop you know, getting stuff that comes from sweatshops, I'll stop. But pretty soon, like Nora's daughter's insight, I realized I can't drive in a car. I can't take a bus that's on a road and not be complicit with um, climate change and supply chains that get the cobalt from child slave labor mines and on and on. And so I'm like, all right, I've got to dwell in the forest and only gather things that I can gather myself. And, and even then I realize I can't actually not cause harm and I can't change the systems at all that way. And so then there was this recognition that I don't get to be a moral being separate from my species, right? Like I am a, I am a part of a species. I'm a part of um, the world, and so uh, <laughs> the inheriting the sins of the forefathers, the sins of the world. If I'm to operate in it at all, I'm part of, which also means then I have an ethical responsibility to try to change as best I can. Um, and so there's something nice about not feeling like you can have the perfect moral high ground and recognizing, no, I can't, but also not just accepting that and going nihilist, right? Saying like, I want to endeavor to do better and I cannot do perfectly. And so when someone is trying to figure out how do I be a good person, if it's really obvious, they're dangerous, right? Because everybody on both sides of all holy wars is crystal clear that their side is right. And if you are really factoring all the complexity, you'll be like, fuck, I don't know if the thing, the choice I'm planning on making is right. I don't know factoring the second, third order effects, everybody else who's involved. But you can't stay stuck in the, because I don't want to be over certain and because I want to factor appropriate uncertainty, you can easily go nihilist from too much uncertainty and just be like, I have no idea, fuck it, I give up. That doesn't work either. So you've got to say, under partial and incomplete information, not being certain, and yet being able to have relatively higher certainties than others, What is and being able to notice and correct for my own biases as best I can, how do I make the best choices that I can that are imperfect but are importantly better than other choices, where I also realize that not acting has moral consequences because I'm then complicit with whatever happens that I didn't do something about. So when I realize that there's moral consequence, ethical consequence to both action and non-action, and that I will always be acting under partial information, then I've got to be really comfortable with uncertainty and also comfortable with relatively better certainties that can inform choice. And yet my relatively better certainty still needs to be open to being radically changed with new insight, new information. And um, so that's, you know, and it's really interesting thing about having kids, you know, you're asking how, how with my experience, so I'm giving my experience as a kid being exposed. So 
a lot of parents might be like, do I want to show my kids what the inside of a factory farm looks like? Do I want to show them what extreme poverty looks like or what clear-cutting line in the Amazon looks like? Because, you know, I grew up with nightmares because of those things. And you're going to traumatize them through the vicarious trauma of the reality of the world. Do I not want to and have them have some happiness that's based on lies that makes them unfit to deal with the world that they will end up having to face and where they can't be part of addressing it? So, you know, I would say, no, I want to choose to help them understand the world, but when are they ready for what things? How do you help them process it? I don't think there's a formulaic answer for that. Um, how do you raise kids now where you can't predict what the adaptive skills will be that they need, but where you also are not just trying to optimize for their quality of life, even though you love them so much, but for the possibility of life for the whole world ongoingly that they can contribute to, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they want to. They want that, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that that's, that's part of that thing is that this is not a parking place. You can't just come to a position and just lock in. It's an ongoing, shifting, ever rigorous um, exploration of some, some very tense um, choices. And what the what that means to be in that uh, that work actually, and the habit of doing that, uh, because you have to be in uncertainty. You have to be comfortable, but not too comfortable in that uncertainty. Um, because if you get too comfortable in, in certainty, uncertainty, then you become shallow. <laughs> And nihilistic. I mean, either one. For some people, ambiguity is just a, a way of brushing it off. Oh, this is just a mystery. Mm -hmm. I just can't know it, so why bother? Which is actually plausible deniability for doing whatever the fuck you want. Right. And so I remember in your talk on Thursday, there was one word that kept coming up that was really important for me that I noticed. And it was the word justify. Um, you were, Daniel was describing this metacrisis in much greater detail than tonight. Tonight was plenty, thank you. Um, and the word justify kept coming up. In what way are we justifying this action or that action or this approach or that approach and what's allowing for that justification? What are the underpinnings of that justification? Um, what I was impressed with in my daughter's question was that she wasn't looking for justification. That's, that's, that's really important and not easy. You know, we talk about moving from um, unwarranted, un, unwarranted certainty in, into uncertainty and unwarranted simplicity into the real complexity of things. But uncertainty and complexity can also be weaponized. I can obviously say, oh, we can't know for sure such and such about climate change, therefore continue maximizing GDP with oil or whatever the fuck I want to. So we can weaponize uncertainty. Um, and we can weaponize complexity by saying, oh, it's <clears throat> you have a very complex situation. I can cherry pick the facts to support any argument I want. So the statistical warfare, right, a, a subset, we talk about kinetic warfare, but then there's non-kinetic warfare, and population-centric warfare, the fight for the minds and hearts of the people. Um, population-centric warfare happens through information warfare, controlling what people believe is true, and um, narrative warfare, controlling the, who they feel is good and right and the in-group they're part of. And, and statistics are just such an amazing weapon, right? Uh, we wrote a paper at the Kinsellians Project called How to Mislead with Facts, and it shows why you can write an article where all of the facts in it will pass the most rigorous fact checker, but because you lake off frame, meaning do I call them terrorists or freedom fighters? Do I call it a protest or a riot? Do I call it undocumented workers or illegal aliens? 
by Lakoff framing, which is not a fact or non-fact, right? It's adding moral valence um, or aesthetic valence to the thing by cherry picking the stats, because I can have stats that will tell very opposite sides of a story, because I'll have a Gaussian distribution of truths and I can cherry pick them. And by decontextualizing them, oh, the average person in the United States in 1815 only lived on a dollar and a half a day and now they live on such and such. Yeah, but they grew their own fucking food and they made their own house and it wasn't mediated by dollars. You decontextualize that fact in a way that made it nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, by decontextualizing facts, Lakoff framing them and uh, cherry picking them, I can make any argument I want with rigorous facts. And so this is basically how mainstream journals lie. Um, and or you know mislead and you're talking about justification there's almost like there's a the dominant narrative of a culture is the apologism for the power structure of the culture it kind of has to be right and so of course if you look at the like you look at the way that somebody like the gates foundation upregulates hans rosling and steven pinker because if you made a lot of money through capitalism and tech, the thinkers who say capitalism and tech makes everything better because they cherry pick and lake off frame and decontextualize, someone who wants that as the apologism to support their power system and say why their power system is good, they'll upregulate those thinkers. So we wrote another paper called the Where Arguments Come From. And it's basically the arguments that start to proliferate don't proliferate for no reason. And they don't proliferate just based on what is objectively true. They proliferate because someone funded that research and then someone funded spreading it because it supports, and someone funded it who has the resources to fund it because it supports whatever that dominant system is. So yeah, the earnestness to want to know what is actually true, and not just true, but representative, right? Because I can have a truth on one side of a cherry-picked argument. Um, it's the process of wanting to bias correct, I think, and trying to deepen earnestness is really critical. So that's what you're mentioning on Justify. This is totally unrelated, but there was one thing that I didn't say to your thing that I wanted to say, because I think it was more important than what I said so far. There's a famous saying in activism that if you aren't outraged, you aren't paying attention. And that was like from the 60s or 70s, but obviously now with catastrophic risk, you know, people can say more like, if you aren't freaked the fuck out, you aren't paying attention. But of course, like Rumi or Hafez would say, if you aren't in utter awe at the beauty of reality, you aren't paying attention. And that's true, and it, it's the truth of that that makes the other one what it is. Because if reality was not beautiful, if it wasn't magnificent, I wouldn't give a shit about if it's going to burn down. And so if I don't connect to the awe at the beauty of it enough, my outrage or whatever will actually mislead me, you know? And so there's an interesting thing like, am I, pe people will ask, um, you know, how do I process all the stuff? Am I optimistic, pessimistic? I absolutely see um, possibilities for political economies and infrastructures and cultures that work within physics and work with what I believe human nature to be that are implementable in time that create both a d desirable and doable world. So I do not think that we have fundamental impossibility issues. That by no means means we will figure it out, right? But my, my motivation is not because I believe we will. Like it's actually not from some optimism like that. It's um, one, I think it's very healthy for people to have experiences that simulate death. So they're comfortable with death, their own death. And being comfortable with your own death you, and comfortable with the reality of death, I think is really important for facing the world effectively because I'm not trying to prevent the inexorable in that way. I'm not freaked out by impermanence. Um, so I think being comfortable with death is one thing. I think being awed by the beauty of life is the next thing. And then realizing that the fear or the outrage are only because I actually love reality, otherwise I wouldn't care. And then tracing the fear and the outrage and the blame back to that love and then saying, how do I be best in service to it? Not because I know for sure it'll succeed, but just because it's the only thing that makes sense. Like it's the only thing that has coherence to it. And then 
sh- I mean, you don't have little kids in your house. Right. But when I had little kids in my house, this is probably the most important thing you can model. And it's both. It's, it's this, this recognition. I mean, I remember saying, I'm really angry because I care. Right? I, I'm really concerned about this. And, and whatever it is, it was it, underneath it is the, the awe for the magnificence of life. And, you know, it's very important that that be part of the experience of the day, whether it's the raspberries on your granola or the, you know, a poem or a, a, a thought or just, you know, when you look across the room and you see somebody that you love and it's just incredible how much you can love them or whatever it is. But, but that is the reason for getting up tomorrow and keeping on doing it and working with everything you've got. There is no other reason because there's certainly no promise of success, whatever that is, even the non-sociopathic kind. <laughs> so I, I think that that for me has been, you know, with my kids. And, and I got that from my dad too. He was, he... He would do this thing where he would look at a tree or a, you know whatever it was, a forest or a tide pool, and see a crab or a sea anemone and just just beam and say, "Ah, oh, you know, what a beauty that one is." Or, "Look at this fella," he would say. This little, you know, but it was like this delight in life that superseded everything else, and then, but it it fuels everything. The reason for studying everything is not because you want to be the smartest person in the room; it's because it's incredible. Yeah, it brings up something, because um, my my area of focus has to do with the intersection of all of the possible catastrophes. People might think that I'm oriented to catastrophize just psychologically or <laughs> pes- pessimistically disposed. <laughs> and um, I'm very positively disposed as a person. Um, and so I focus on those things because they're real things, not, not because I'm oriented. In fact, a lot of the people who focus on catastrophic risk are because they catastrophize, right? And it's actually, it, it messes the field up because it makes it very hard for them to work together because then they catastrophize their relationships with each other and think they can't trust each other and it makes it very hard to coordinate. And, um, <clears throat> and But I mostly want people working in the space who uh, just I'll tell a story. I have a friend who is very good in catastrophic risk work and who is uh, almost always uh, almost cripplingly anxious. And I pointed something out to him that if someone shares with him a new risk that they come up with, a, the fluorinated surfactants have passed planetary boundaries or this particular thing with what's going to happen with the Twitter acquisition or whatever it is, instantly he starts to think about all the second, third order effects and how that will accelerate collapse, and he and he buys it. And if someone tells him a possible solution to one of them, instantly his mind looks for why it's wrong. But his mind doesn't look for why the catastrophe might not happen. And so there is a, which is why he's good at that thing, but also imbalanced, right? And I'm like, no, I want you to do both. Like, I want you to look for why the catastrophic forecast might be wrong but I, and, and right, and I want you to look at why the solution might be wrong and, and right. But you have a, an uneven distribution. So I said, we're going to do a strategy meeting, but I'm going to put you on MDMA first <laughs> because I want you to see that a part of your epistemology is just a result of your own state that was conditioned in childhood for some reasons I didn't know about him. But I'm like, I want to put you in a state where you feel – what happens is only when the story s- 
says dread is coming, does it feel true for him because of the dread that is carried inside? Probably because, you know, whenever dad walked in, it felt like dread and that's still embedded or something like that. And I'm like, when you're in a totally different state, what lands as true, because ultimately we're less logically formal than we think. There's like a felt sense of truthiness that's a big part of our epistemology. And so put him on ecstasy. He was rolling and happy. And then I'm walking through catastrophic risks and solutions. And he was doing completely different logic. <laughs> and I had to point out to him he's doing completely different logic. And so, of course, I want, I want people to try to notice their biases and correct them think through the same thing from a lot of different epistemologies and a lot of different states and a lot of different perspectives. Um, but ultimately, it's not some kind of negativity or catastrophic or pessimistic bias that has me focus on this. It's uh, the love of life that wants to protect it, so wants to understand what to protect and how to be effective at that. Um, but there's like, yeah, it's actually an affirmation of beauty that is at the source of it, so just thought I'd say that. I, I'm coming back to this attention question um, because, I, I, you know, the doom porn, okay? So, so there's lots of people who talk about the way that we have been talking about the meta crisis as this kind of super exciting doom porn. And the more you talk about it, like the, the kind of more like, oh, it gets. It's like, a, you know, and it can get addictive. Um, but, you know, I, re I remember, whatever it was, when I was a kid growing up, we were having conversations at the dinner table that were not so dissimilar to the one we're having tonight. What are we going to do, et cetera. I mean, these conversations are not new. Um, and there was the sense that, oh, if we could just get people afraid, they would respond. They would. We did a good job at that. Yeah, and it didn't do anything. <laughs> well, no, they did. What? Well, hold on, let me finish. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the idea being that the opposite of the numbness would be fear and pain. If they could feel the pain, if they could feel the fear, they would respond. But I, what I'm hoping you're hearing is that, in, in fact, the opposite of that numbness is sensitivity. And the sensitivity has got to be more dimensional than fear and pain. It must include beauty and curiosity. It has to include remorse, and it has to include humor. It has to include lots of different textures of sensitivity, lots of flavors of ideas, lots of kinds of relationships to explore all of those in. And that is what allows for a kind of e ecology of sensitivity that, that I think is that attention that you're speaking to that's really important. Um, so I think it, it's innate. It is there. It is there. But it can get grooved in to various um, habits, scripts, tones of what's the tone of the environmental movement. Yeah, you, you know what the tone of the environmental movement is. Right? It, there's a tone. What's the tone of the gender activist space? There's a tone. And to, to expand those tonalities into much more multi-tonal spaces is, I think, part of increasing that sensitivity. Well, if you drive fear or anger, uh, a few things can happen. One is you can desensitize people, right? And everybody just goes numb. And the other thing that you do is um, drive war and drive uh, scared radical actions. And so one of the things that I want people to think about the most is in whatever project you're campaigning for, you communicate about it in a way that you think will appeal to a particular demographic to make sure we really stop spraying the neonicotinoid pesticides or deal with the climate change thing or deal with the abortion rights thing or whatever the thing is. But if you don't think enough about how that communication will affect the people who don't agree and what the blowback of that will be, then you're producing not just the immediate movement forward of coalescing those who are going to respond, you're also producing 
blowback of other people who are not inert, right? Who are political actors, who disagree, who feel scared, who feel what you're doing is endangering something that they care about. And then they employ some more powerful technologies. And so then you just drive an arms race and the arms race ends up having more consequence than the issue itself did, right? The degree of polarization, the break of the social contract, the break of democracy in the process. So just one very simple practical thing in any kind of activism is think about the people that your message doesn't appeal to and think about why it doesn't and how to include them in it and the blowback of the message, right? And if you aren't doing that, it's like strategy 101 is not even being factored. What And uh, uh, in order to do that, you actually have to understand their perspective better. In order to do that, you'll realize that the issue complexifies and you realize that the strategy you were pushing, not just the messaging, is the wrong strategy. There's partial things right to it, but um, the things that, why they don't like it and are pushing back are also real things that have to be factored into the strategy. The way we talk about this sometimes is as an ecology of communication, that everything you're saying is landing in an ecology. How's it landing? What is it allowing to grow? What is it prohibiting from growing? What is it? What is going to come out of this thing that you are putting in the communication context? Um, and and incidentally, this is true certainly if you're a politician or an activist, and it's also true in your house. And attention to that ecology of communication with your partner, with your kids, with your aging parents, whoever you're speaking with, or in communion with. Um, is going to be responding to that. What responses have you left open? Which ones have you closed? So this idea of, I'm just going to say what I think and I'm not responsible for the way it makes you feel, is a mess, actually. That is a mess. And, and so this recognition that, that there is this not only first order of, I'm going to teach my kid to do the dishes, so they're going to do it on Wednesday, but also now I have just actually created a form of communication around what it is to be responsible that dislocates responsibility. And that was the second order thing that I accidentally taught, right? So this ecology of communication i think is running through everything we're talking about and, and it has to do with the thing we started with which is what world are you perceiving and how are you going to respond to it the i'm not responsible for how you feel snowflake i'm going to say what the fuck i want to say and you can deal with it is a mess but the other side which is how you feel should completely control what i say and um, that I'm not going to say anything that's going to ruffle any feathers is a total mess. And so there's a dialectic, and it's very easy to polarize that dialectic rather than synthesize it, right? To yeah. say, because one side expressed in extreme sounds so ridiculous, I'm going to take the other extreme. Yeah. As opposed to there is a partial truth in each side of this dialectic. So um, should I not say anything that bothers anyone? No. Do I care about the effect that I have on other people? And do I not want to have an effect that might harden them into their positions further? That's also true, right? So one very simple principle I would say is any value that you care about, look at the opposing value, right? Ecclesiastes, there's a time to kill and a time to heal and to sow and to reap. Well, how do you know what time it is? There's a, there's a discernment that is a, there's a presence and a discernment that is a higher order value than either of those other values, it says how to navigate that dialectic. So um, if you take whatever your belief on a topic is as the thesis, then say, who, is, who are the smartest people I can find who really disagree with me on this? Find the antithesis. See if you can understand their reasoning really deeply, deeply enough that you can express it and they don't need to correct you. And then see how it changes your position and if there is a synthesis that is a higher order insight that contains elements of both of those. So on values, seek the values dialectic. Well, it's about personal freedom. Well, it's also about collective responsibility. It's about the value of the traditions that have served us. It's about the progress into the new world, right? Find whatever the value is, seek the opposing value, see how they exist in a dynamic tension. 
find the proposition, find the anti-proposition, find the synthesis, it's amazing how something that simple can guide so much. And sometimes the thing you're looking for is in another context. Um, I, I have found so often that I'm just asking the wrong question. Mm -hmm. And that when there is a polarity like that, that if you ask a question that's in another context, the polarity undoes itself. Yeah. Um, most of the time, in order to really hold a polarity, it requires a, a reductionism. It requires a decontextualization. The more context you add, the more that polarity is going to dissolve. Um, and, and then it becomes, oh, well, what question actually were we working on? So it, it can be a real distraction to think, you know, if the question is, how am I going to get my kid through fifth grade? I have to get them to be, you know, get good grades and be a good, good kid. Uh, that's a very different question than how am I going to support my kid to figure out how to be in a world that's really difficult right now. And the two are probably the same question. Probably one of the reasons your fifth grader is struggling is because they're struggling with things that are floating around in the, in the sphere uh, of shared information and the common sense. If, you know, beginning to show your kids that you are an advocate for them, that together we're going to walk into this unknown future, makes it a lot easier to sit through fifth grade. It, what you said just reminded me of uh, a couple things um, that my parents did that I think are really cool that they held as like important principles of uh, parenting and teaching. One was um, my dad was really into asking kids, what do you think happens to consciousness after death? And questions around free will and questions that no person has any good reason to have confidence in. They're at the boundaries of philosophy. So he's like, the kid's thoughts are totally equal, yeah. equally valid to my thoughts on it because it's not a topic that we have good epistemic basis to know. So we get to have we get to come into symmetry and have a conversation where I have reason to be interested in what they think about it and I can't actually claim any authority in it. And I thought it was such a cool insight to try to find context in which you can be in symmetry. And I thought uh, another one of the ones was, uh, he said that there were so few times that the adult was interacting with the kid where the adult didn't have an agenda for the kid, and the kid could feel that they want me to do my chores or do my homework or behave a certain way or, and to spend agendaless time with them where you just come in and interact and find out what they're interested in and follow that and how uh, profound an experience it is when a kid has someone there that is seeking to facilitate them, but not with a direction. I love that. I think my dad was really curious. Um, he was always very aware that the problems with epistemologies is they, it's hard to know where the edge of your epistemology is. You know, you get caught in the matrix. And um, so he was always seeking various experiences and possible relationship with those potential moments where you get a teeny peek outside the epistemological box, right? Talking to people from other cultures. Um, various kinds of, of, you know, he worked with people with mental health issues because they were able to perceive the world differently. Talking to children, in being in relationship with animals and other organisms, um, trance, um, various kinds of psychedelics. And any chance he could get to be get a tiny little peek outside the way that so many ideas have formed around each other that we don't even know how we're holding them s stuck together. Um, and so as a child, he would he would play. I mean, he was the agenda was not um, the agenda was what's she going to say? <laughs> what's what's what can we find here? Because I don't know what world she's seeing, and this is a great opportunity to get another viewpoint. Uh, and I, I loved that. I felt like, oh boy, I am important. And um, 
And I was important. And that was such a great thing to be at the table with all these important people and be seven years old and know that I had something that was important too. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Parents can definitely raise, particularly parents of lineages of success can raise their kids with a thought of their importance that is massively oppressive, mm -hmm. right? But it's also interesting, the studies done in the U.S. where uh, teachers were told that a group of kids that were moving into the class from another school that had all been failing were A students. And because they wrongly believed they were A students, they treated them differently and the kids became A students. Um, and it's interesting how much the sense of the meaningfulness of the kid's life that the people facilitating them bring in can actually reflect in who they become. So recognizing we're probably at time, and on the topic of your dad giving the sense of that you were important, I, uh, I think that your warm data work is one of the best second simplicity um, teaching methods I've ever come across. Because when you're describing it to people, like conversations about very mundane things uh, where you're just changing context, they don't get that what you're actually doing is teaching people how to see through lots of different perspectives, synthesize those perspectives. Um, so I'm really happy to get to have this little dinner time with everybody here tonight. I don't live in the area. Nora lives in the area. And I was just thinking about all the topics, especially if anybody here, our parents, are thinking about being parents that we opened up, some of which are huge. Like, yeah, what are you going to – is Stockholm going to be Kiev at some point? And um, is the whole world going to go through these massive transitions? And are you raising your kids to perform a job that won't exist by the time they do? And on and on. And – to not leave people there, I was asking Nora at the break if she would offer some kind of warm data process on learning, and she said it's already booked. And so I thought that'd be a good thing to bring up before we close. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the 26th, we're going to be doing a warm data lab here in this very room. Um, I, and I think we should probably do it on learning. What is learning in a changing world? October. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just in a few days. Will you be gone by then? <clears throat> Darn. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you. This was, yeah, uh, we didn't know what we were going to talk about, just open conversation. And we actually don't, we've maybe only had three conversations ever. So we're just getting to know each other. And this is really fun. It and thanks, everybody, also for coming. I hope something was useful, interesting. We're going to hang out and be available to talk, so we're here for a bit. Yes. And thanks. And to the people thanks. who hosted this. Daniel, thanks Anna, thanks Johanna for the dinner, and everybody else who helped to put this together. Thank you so much. <laughs>